What do you think of when we use the word landscape? Do you think of a natural sweep with hills and trees? Perhaps patches of land indicating a human presence. Perhaps towns, farms, bridges, roads. How can you observe a landscape? For many of you, you've observed a landscape from a photograph, a picture in a book, or as in this case, a slide. When we see a landscape that way, we observe a flat surface and imagine dimension, but never very far. We see, but we do not experience details. We miss smell, temperature, sound. We lose context, both the context of the location to its surroundings and the context of the individual's perception of the location, what it means to them. Perhaps we get more from an aerial view. We can see down from above and note the relationship of one feature to another. But we lose the human perspective. We lose dimension. Our view is surficial and uniform, flattening out our perception. Perhaps we can see it from the ground itself, relating it to our perspective. We look ahead and relate everything by distance from us and size compared to us. Looking straight forward, we can sense the ground cover. We can smell and hear the environment. We can note the temperature and light. In this sense, we're an observer of something within which we exist, though there's still an out there beyond our immediate senses. Or perhaps we can vicariously take it in from a video. In such a case, we become more involved, but remain an outside observer. We can hear, but only what we're allowed to hear. We're immersed only so far and only where permitted. Take a moment to look at the video that is embedded in this PowerPoint and come back when you are ready. All right, we have now experienced from a photograph, from an aerial, from standing, and from a video. But of course, the best way to experience a landscape is walking the ground itself. Now we can see our perspective change depending on our point of view from place to place. Now a structure is no longer a stationary item, but an object impacted by the conditions around it and our experience of it as we discover new viewpoints and relate them to what we think we already know. And that change of viewpoint and perception is critical to our understanding of place and to this course. 
because how we relate to a location has everything to do with our perception of it. Remember those classic maps from the age of exploration with their dire written and drawn warnings that beyond this point there be dragons? That perception of parts of the open sea was not simply a reflection of a naturalist's observation of large winged or snake-like creatures while on an exploratory voyage. That warning was a reflection of perceived real and imagined attributes, both taken from and placed upon a location by observers and others. In the same way, our perception of a place, a landscape, is not just derived from what we see, but what we experience, think, imagine, believe, plus what others have seen and believed, all stacked into the location like data layers in a GIS image or an interactive map. Even a seemingly simple location, such as an English village, with its church, wall, and village green has several layers to its landscape. There's the environmental landscape of the village green and surroundings, the trees, the sky, the fields, which might add to our enjoyment of the location during a nice sunny day. There's the physical landscape of rock, and water, topography. There's the economic landscape of the fields and shops that feed the village and provide some support and comfort for its inhabitants, possibly at the expense of some of the local natural resources in the ecological and physical landscapes. There's the socio-political landscape of the settlement, neighborhood, village plan, and surroundings that lead to the location of the church in the middle of the town in the first place. And that can create some tension when interacting with other nearby villages. There's the military landscape of castle and wall that occasionally comes in handy when local interactions go poorly. There is the spiritual landscape of the church, graveyard, and ancient places that situates the world that the villagers perceive directly within another world which they do not perceive directly or completely understand. And then there's the imagined landscape of legends and folklore that can make some places in or near the village dangerous, mysterious, forbidden, while other places become worthy of a pilgrimage. In other words, landscape is not just a picture. It has physical and mental dimensionality, as well as a surface and a climate. Moreover, landscapes do not stand still. We must also understand that landscape changes over time. It can change through gradual, natural processes. As you can see here, with a church slowly eroding into the sea over centuries. It can change through catastrophic natural events. Ask any Englishman you meet about the rains of 2014. It can change from human perception. It can change from human action or inaction. In our village, just like in most places we know, this last one is probably the most active. When we add the fourth dimension, time, we see landscapes in motion. Some aspects of it, like mountains, or legend, barely moving at all in our time scales. Others, like vegetation and human structures, shifting like a living creature. To even begin to understand how these shifts operate, we must experience the landscape outside the classroom. We must look at the various layers of time and meaning and ask how these layers were established and how they have changed through time. We must ask how much the perceived landscape is real in the physical sense, and how much of it has been imposed upon by our activities, ideas, or imaginations. We must question the future of the landscape. Will humans so alter the landscape into a built scape that even the mountains will change? We must finally ask if the actions and perceptions we placed on the landscape at some time in the past impacted human society, either at that time or in their future. In this course, we're going to take one region, Great Britain, and apply these layers. We will look not only at how the English landscape has changed through time, but how different aspects of the landscape interact. Consider these juxtapositions, for example. Stonehenge, as you see it, 
is 3,600 years old. And yet we see it within a 20th century tourist perspective, surrounded by sheep moor and a military reservation. Those 3,600 years in between are barely noted in the landscape, and there's no one with a 36-year-old memory around to explain the importance, feeling, or use of that 3,600-year-old site to us 20th century tourists. From one point, at Grimm's Pound, the Devil's Enclosure in Dartmoor, one can see Stone Age monuments next to medieval tin mining scars, the remains of 200-year-old rabbit fences next to an old coach inn, and a modern road cutting through the desolate moors. And yet, most modern people know the site best as one of many scene settings from an early 1900s crime novel. A visitor to York can go underground to see ruins from the Roman, Viking, and medieval period, but can see all these things above ground as well, as the city both built around and over its past. The Fenlands are a remnant of a world 8,000 years and more in the past, a small fragment of a landscape now so changed that there is very little left of the original elevation, woodland, or even soil. To have even a tiny chance to see more, you'd have to swim for it. We will visit a slice of these and other landscapes. Some of the questions we will ask include, how has this landscape changed physically since the first human occupation? What was the impact of different societies on the use of the landscape? What have been the most dramatic changes since the end of the Ice Age? What layers of use, economic, environmental, spiritual, political, military, recreational, can we see in the landscape, and how do they interact? What do the sheep think of all of this as they continue to munch complacently? In particular, we will explore the Downs of Southwest England, the most heavily used landscape of the Bronze Age. The rocky landscape and moors of Cornwall, defined as a backbone of stone cutting into the Atlantic like a tail, with its fossil landscapes of the late Bronze Age. The coast of Northern Wales, and Snowdonia Park, one of the most formidable landscapes in Britain and home to the highest peak in the realm, Mount Snowdon. Hadrian's Wall in the Great North, the bleak frontier of the Roman Empire. The great medieval townscapes of York and Durham, featuring layers of use from the Roman to the modern. The flatlands of the Fens, some of the most valuable land in England. Finally, the great megalopolis of London, the ultimate builtscape. By the end of this course, you will learn how to see a landscape in all its interconnected layers. But for now, relish the experience of seeing England from the air if you're lucky enough to have a window seat, and be prepared for the adventure of your life while examining the adventure of theirs.